Evan, hey, congratulations for your documentary, I Got a Monster. Thank you. This documentary is fascinating. I don't know how you did it. I was like mesmerized. I had to kept, keep on watching how the story unfolded. <laughs> so, well, thank you. I'm glad that it pulled you in. That That is the ultimate compliment. Well, f first of all, admittingly, I had no idea about this story. Maybe I just don't follow enough current news, but what sparked you to do this documentary? Yeah, I mean, we were approached by a, a dear friend of mine who's a local reporter and writer in Baltimore, and he was covering the stories of these corrupt cops for years, who's writing for the local city paper, and he's a bit of a Hunter S. Thompson type, big personality, really part of the community. And he was just getting really enraged about what was doing happening. And over time, he collected enough stories and enough evidence that they decided him and a re reporting partner, Brandon Soderberg, to write a book about it. And as they were beginning to put the book proposal together, he reached out to tell me about the story. And immediately I was taken by the crime and thriller elements about it. But then as we got deeper into the actual story itself, I began to really get moved and frustrated and angered by the whole elements relating to local rights and the citizens' rights and who is protecting and listening to these people. So it evolved really quickly, and we just took it upon ourselves to hustle out some money. I flew myself to Baltimore really quickly, and we just started interviewing people. So how 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 much involvement were the uh, book author um, into your documentary? Oh, I mean, I always consider both of those guys to be, you know, the second and third directors in a lot of ways. They researched as we were doing it. They introduced us to a lot of the people that we interview in it. And they were really what gave us the ability to go in and, and gain the trust of everybody so quickly because they had such a good reputation locally and they were doing right by the victims in the story. So we were making the film as they were writing the book simultaneously and a lot of the stuff that we have in interviews they used the transcripts for the book and the research that they were doing we used in the movie so it was a very collaborative process that ran truly a parallel line together did you have to uh, go go off and do your own research too or did oh, you rely, rely of, them of course i was humbled really quickly when i jumped in the conversation and, in, you know, Baltimore is an incredible city. It's the most charming, unbelievably welcoming city. But if you don't speak right, they'll put you in your place really quickly. So just so I felt like I was swimming above water, dove in, tried to do as much as I could, did a lot of historical research on the, the nature of what modern policing was about, how it's become statistically based, all the fallout and the dangers between that and the use of specific task force for arresting and for trying to take a more aggressive means to handle larger crimes and cases. So yeah, I mean, the research is always what ends up becoming my greatest drug because I, I love the context and the history around things. And this one was just, there was just so much, so much story, so many people and such a history of how this truly was an example for a greater national issue. Now, Obviously, this is a, you know, a very important issue and a very important case. Was there at any moment any pushback um, for, for you to proceed? You know, we got lucky with the victims. The police department was welcoming. They supported us. A lot of people that formerly worked for the police department. There's a lot of people that we thought initially would give us pushback. And they, by the time we got involved in the story, the case was over. The cops were convicted. They got sentenced. So we came in in a place where Baltimore A needed to do some, I think, course correction and some PR wrangling to let them know that they were addressing what's going on. And B, the secrets to some extent were already out. So we were welcomed in that way. That said, a lot of the family members that were related to the cops involved were not interested in talking to us. And they still felt like they were trying to protect their families, their husbands, their wives, their brothers. So we couldn't really get ever any time with them, which I would have liked to, but I don't think it's really relevant to the story we ended up telling. Now, tell tell us about, you know, obviously Wayne Jenkins is the ringleader and um, and central to, uh, to your documentary. But I guess a lot of people would say, you know, there, there has to be more and and why why is all the focus on this one particular guy? Well, he was the most egregious. He truly was like, 
the Batman. He was the leading star of it. We used to always joke that he was the Denzel Washington from Training Day. Like his stuff was so bonkers and so nutty and so consistent that he just was more aggressively bad about it. And he outshone all these other corrupt cops. That said, I mean, two of the other cops in the story that we touch upon, one of these guys, Daniel Hersel, he was assigned to Jenkins in this task force. The IA used to say that he had so many complaints against them that the IA should create its own additional IA just to handle his complaints. And the other cop that eventually led to the downfall, he was getting tracked by the FBI and people on separate drug related suspicions. So he was being very he was very involved in facilitating some local heroin dealers and helping them move their product and creating protection for them. So Jenkins was by in no means the only one doing this. He just was the most extreme version of it. Now, how did you convince the victims to basically speak to you in concerning for the documentary, especially as uh, you know the uh, um, the 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 former witness and drug dealer? I mean, yeah. I mean, I I was even shocked you even got him to speak to you. That was a that was a long dance. We talked to him and his team for, God, probably close to seven, eight, nine months, and we actually filmed him the day before he had to turn himself in to get processed and get sent off to prison. We actually filmed him walking into the court building in Baltimore as he's turning himself in. Um, he was challenging at first, once again, did not trust us, but he had a relationship with our reporters. They were talking to each other for a while. And strangely, he's become a friend. We stay in touch now. He'll be at the premiere of the movie next week. And he's become a huge advocate for trying to take accountability for his part in what was happening. And I think for him, this was a good way of him sort of showing to the world and to himself the guilt, accepting it, and and trying to help him set himself on a better path. But he was also an incredible personality. I mean, you watch it. The guy is all charisma. Like, you sit with him for 20 minutes. Like, he'll sell you a car. He'll sell you your watch and, you know, then take you out for dinner and leave you with the bill. And you're still loving him. So it's like, <laughs> great guy large personality and we were just lucky that he chose to trust us with his story and how how about the victims how did you was it easy to convince them because i you know being a victim in something like this is probably very hard after the, the distrust with the law enforcement yeah we once again that was really us getting rewarded with the generosity of our partners Baynard and Brandon had some relationships with some of these people. Once again, their integrity and reporting skills showed the victims that we weren't going to mistrust, we weren't going to mistreat their trust. So that opened up a lot of doors. In anticipation, Ivan Bates, who's a lawyer that we feature heavily in the film, he represented a lot of the victims and he as well spoke to them on our behalf. And because of the verdicts that he was able to get them and the relationships that he had pre existing with them, they were able to trust us as well and gave us the time. I was going to say, I've, Ivan Bates w w um, was portrayed as a very good person in your uh, in in your film, and uh, it, he 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 didn't seem like he wanted to hold back on anything. No, I mean this was an incredibly challenging time for him. He uh, when we started interviewing him, he ran for state's attorney, did not win and was just really frustrated by the system and wanted to try to fix what was going on in Baltimore. And this was one of the ways that he figured that he could help do it. And even leading up to that, he was at that point amassing a large file of cases that all were dealing with the corrupt practices of Wayne Jenkins. He was the one that saw how poorly he was behaving, was able to connect the dots between the arrests of the people that he was representing and the bad reporting and the bad copying of Jenkins. Now, the great irony is that, you know, recently Ivan's been elected to be state's attorney. So there was, in some ways, some reward for his his diligence and his his efforts in trying to take this down. And now he's trying to do something better for the city on a, on a higher level. Now, this investigation is still ongoing, um, obviously, with the Baltimore Police Department and and so on. The FBI that was interviewed uh, in in your documentary, did they participate because they wanted to warn the police uh, that they're doing this or, or are they just willing because the case was closed? I mean, that's a wonderful question. The case was closed, so that gave them the freedom to speak objectively about it and open and honestly. 
And I also think they wanted to, they, they should be proud of the work they did. And even the victims point to how people like that and the prosecutors that were prosecuting the um, gun trace task force were really committed to doing a good job and getting justice served. They came in in a very complicated, weird cross section of multiple cases, sifted through it, and throughout that found a way to safely get these guys to turn themselves in and to stop crime from happening. Like, I look at that as a great success case for them, and I'm sure that they wanted to share it too. It's it's amazing. I, I feel like after this documentary, like, Kevin, you should just do a feature film and um, make it. <laughs> I mean, we keep talking about it. There is so much more story even left on the cutting room floor. You know, in the dream scenario, I'd love a three season show just talking about <laughs> the systematic nature of policing in Baltimore. I feel like it, uh, it could probably lead to a lot of, you know, really necessary conversations. Now, this uh, Gun Trace uh, Task Force, um, is that still around after, you know, all of this? That has been disbanded, but there's still task force that are actively being used by the Baltimore Police Department. And there's still a lot of controversy with the way that they're handling arrests and situations. Last year, somebody was murdered or shot. I mean, depending on how you look at the evidence by one of the task force and unfortunately killed. And there's been a lot of fallout right now about how to handle what's going on with those police officers. And once again, asking the question of how do you allow this type of aggressive policing to exist in a way that still holds accountability for the officer's behavior and protects the rights of the citizens? I mean, these these task forces still uh, in in the news today. I mean, we just had one with the recent uh, Tennessee uh yeah. meeting and that and that was from a task force too and we, yeah. we we have no idea what actually went on until someone truly truly investigates yeah and you know unfortunately the outcome is terrible but fortunately there was some camera that at least caught a large portion of what happened which allows for them to have to face part of the behavior now mm. what happens at that point will be left up to the system but it is once again a testament of how this conversation is really should be at the top of a lot of police departments' minds says, if you're going to do this, how do you do it and still protect your citizens in the conversation? Well said. And one more thought before I leave, leave, leave you is, uh, as audiences have a chance to watch I Got a Monster, what is the one most important thing you hope that they walk away with? That everybody has the right to the protection of their rights and to be protected by the police departments. You know, in the story, a lot of the people that were victims had criminal histories and past that still doesn't give them the rights to go and target them and to abuse that history for their own benefit. The part of policing that I think keeps getting lost in the conversation is they exist to create harmony for the community. And that needs to be protected at all costs. You cannot enable somebody to, or empower somebody to risk that harmony for statistics or for their own greed or bad intent. Well said, well said. And real fast, the lasting image, the very, the last uh, image of everyone raising their fists, uh, you know, there, there wasn't context of that. Uh, who were they? So those were one of the people that we interviewed was this guy, PFK Boom, and he was a local activist. He was very involved in the, the riots and the protests leading up to the Freddie Gray or after the Freddie Gray incident. He was somebody that welcomed us into Baltimore and gave us a true POV as to what the citizens are facing. And he was the one who told me that this isn't about black and blue. This is about blue and everybody else. And he made it very clear that it was about the power of the police, not about the racism behind it. Well said, well said. Well, Kevin... Thank you very much uh, for speaking to us about carrying a conversation of I Got a Monster. It is a fascinating, and I want to say, um, to comment, is, is beautifully shot. It is terrific. Oh, so I will let the DP you. know. He'll be very happy. Okay, <laughs> terrific. Thank you very much. Appreciate Wonderful. it. Wonderful. Good talking to you.